This is Senator J. William Fulbright. He was born in 1905 as the fourth of six children of J. and Roberta Fulbright, who were homesteaders in Missouri. He grew up in Fayetteville in northwestern Arkansas. His father was a hog farmer turned investor and successful entrepreneur. Consequently, Bill Fulbright grew up in one of the wealthiest and most influential families of Fayetteville. He attended grade school and high school at the Peabody Experimental School, a teacher training facility for the School of Education on the campus of the University of Arkansas, which was just four blocks from his family's stately home. After graduating from high school, he enrolled at the University of Arkansas, was a good student, elected president of the student body, and excelled on the football field. He graduated in 1924. Fulbright literally grew up on the campus of the University of Arkansas and rarely left Fayetteville. His childhood and youth were privileged and patrician, but parochial and provincial too. His leadership profile, decent grades, athleticism, and his family's social standing made him an attractive candidate for a Rhodes Scholarship. Starting in the fall of 1925, he studied history and government at Oxford's Pembroke College for three years and traveled extensively on the European continent. He also played tennis, rugby, and lacrosse and was active in student clubs. His Rhodes Scholarship was a transformative experience for him. He later called it the dominant influence in the creation of the Fulbright Awards. After graduating in June 1928, Fulbright traveled in Europe with his mother, then settled in Vienna for eight months, where he spent an increasing amount of time at the Café Louvre, a hangout for American journalists and European newspaper correspondents. These Viennese contacts and exposure to life in Central Europe provided him with what his biographer Randall Woods has called his introduction to the real world of international politics. After returning to the United States, he studied law with distinction at George Washington University in Washington, D.C., married Elizabeth Williams, and worked at the Department of Justice for a year. He then taught law at GW as an instructor for two semesters before returning to Arkansas in 1934 to manage family businesses and lecture part-time at the University of Arkansas Law School. In 1939, at the age of 34, he was named president of the University of Arkansas, an appointment that testified to the reputation and political clout of his family and ultimately began his career in politics. In 1942, he ran successfully for the House of Representatives and was off to Washington, where he gained national attention in 1943 as an advocate of internationalism by authoring the so-called Fulbright Resolution, favoring the participation of the United States in what was to become the United Nations. In 1944, he ran successfully for the U.S. Senate, where he served five terms and eventually became the longest-serving chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. In August 1945, Fulbright was shocked by the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He immediately recognized the implications of the advent of the nuclear age for international politics and called the atomic bombings in Japan the immediate cause of my sponsorship of the legislation to set up an exchange program. On September 27, 1945, six weeks after the end of the war, Fulbright introduced a bill to the Senate authorizing the use of credits established through the sale of surplus properties abroad for the promotion of international goodwill through the exchanges of students in the fields of education, culture, and science. Fulbright's bill was based on a simple but ingenious idea, amending the Surplus Property Act of 1944 a piece of legislation that had nothing to do with education or exchanges. The purpose of the Surplus Property Act was to help the U.S. transition from a wartime to a peacetime economy by selling off wartime surpluses at home and abroad, and this created windfall revenues in non-convertible currencies overseas. Identifying these revenues from the sale of wartime surpluses overseas to finance exchanges was Fulbright's inspired idea. Fulbright's initial bill needed to be refined and amended, and he inconspicuously moved it through Congress without attracting much attention or debate. Looking back, he said he knew it was potentially controversial. President Truman signed Fulbright's amendment into law on August 1, 1946. This is the Fulbright Act in its entirety. It is less than two pages long and highly technical, and it has an almost incomprehensible title an act to amend the Surplus Property Act of 1944 to designate the Department of State as the disposal agency for surplus property outside of the continental United States, its territories, and for other purposes. One of those other purposes was to fund the academic exchanges 
Fulbright initially had proposed in September 1945. The Fulbright Act established the basic architecture of the Fulbright Program by doing five things. First, it designated the State Department as the sole agency of the U.S. government for the disposal of surplus properties overseas. The U.S. government had billions of dollars of wartime material stockpiled overseas in former theaters of war, building materials, fuel, vehicles, medicine, food. These assets, which the historian Sam Lebovich has called war junk, were complicated and expensive to maintain. Foreign governments did not have the U.S. dollars to buy them, so the U.S. government decided to extend credits to foreign governments and to accept non-convertible foreign currencies as payment in order to sell them. Second, it authorized the Secretary of State to conclude executive agreements with foreign governments to fund exchanges with countries that had purchased wartime surpluses. Between 1947 and 1952, the United States concluded 28 executive agreements with countries in former theaters of war on four continents where surplus properties were available. After 1955, 15 further Fulbright agreements, based on the sale of agricultural surpluses, were concluded, which also extended the program to Latin America. Third, these executive agreements provided for the establishment of unique binational educational commissions that had boards with equal numbers of members, with the Americans appointed by U.S. ambassadors and citizens from partner countries nominated by their own governments. This parity made participating countries equal partners in a program of reciprocal exchanges. These boards then hired local staff to manage the program on the ground. Fulbright commissions recruited outgoing students and scholars for grants to go to the United States and hosted incoming U.S. Fulbright grantees. All Fulbright grantees traveled by ocean liner in the olden days when international travel was rare and a real luxury. Fourth, it earmarked funds for these bilateral exchanges. A, for financing studies, research, instruction, and other educational activities of or for American citizens abroad including payment for transportation, tuition, maintenance, and other expenses. However, under B, it only provided for furnishing transportation for citizens of foreign countries who wanted to study in the United States. This established the original asymmetrical structure of the program. Grants initially could cover all of the costs incurred by U.S. grantees overseas with foreign currencies, but none of the costs incurred by foreign grantees in the United States in U.S. dollars because all of the revenues were in foreign currencies. Nor did the Act provide for the U.S. dollars necessary to cover the costs for the stateside administration of the program. These shortcomings urgently needed to be addressed in order to get the program off the ground. Fifth, the Fulbright Act authorized the U.S. President to appoint a Board of Foreign Scholarships, BFS, consisting of 10 members composed of representatives of cultural, educational, student, and war veteran groups. The BFS was populated with a representative cross-section of leading academics, university executives, and experts who, as private citizens, assumed the responsibility for establishing Fulbright program policies and governing the program. The State Department's Office for Exchanges, the forerunner of today's Bureau for Educational and Cultural Affairs, assumed administrative tasks and the BFS decided to turn to a number of existing organizations to help manage the program. These so-called cooperating agencies were the Conference Board of Associated Research Councils for Scholars, the Institute for International Education in New York City for graduate students, and the U.S. Office of Education for teachers. This put the final touches on the architecture of the program, which was complicated with lots of different players and moving parts. The red boxes on the left from top to bottom, the Board of Foreign Scholarships, the State Department Office for Exchanges, and the cooperating agencies were in the United States. The red boxes on the right, the executive agreements that established binational commissions with their staffs, provided for the program overseas. Two factors decisively contributed to getting the Fulbright program off the ground. The first was the passage of the United States Information and Educational Exchange Act of 1948, or Smith-Munt Act, which provided urgently needed U.S. dollars for the stateside costs of the Fulbright program, as well as for the establishment of other U.S. government exchange programs. Second, the BFS solicited support for incoming Fulbright grantees from the diverse institutions 
of American higher education communities. And they really stepped up to the plate to host them by covering their costs with comprehensive packages of cash and in-kind support. Incoming Fulbrighters were genuinely impressed by the friendliness, curiosity, generosity, and hospitality they experienced in the United States. Once all of the necessary operative parts had fallen into place, the program rapidly gained momentum. In 1948-49, only 84 grantees in three countries participated in the program. However, in the following year, there were over 1,800 grantees from 11 countries, and by 1955-56, 4,700 grantees from 22 countries. The program grew by leaps and bounds in the 50s and 60s. Today, 79% of the program's 400,000-plus alumni have been sponsored by countries with binational Fulbright commissions. On August 1, 1961, President Kennedy invited Senator Fulbright and the congressman who had played key roles in the passage of the legislation in 1946 to a 15th anniversary commemoration of the program in the Rose Garden at the White House. He observed that, This program has been one of the great acts of creative and constructive statesmanship in the post-war period. Fulbright grants are known throughout the world for the ceaseless, informal, and effective work they do for a better world understanding and for developing the talent of individuals. By 1961, 41 countries with Fulbright commissions were participating in the program, which had over 50,000 alumni, which made it the largest exchange program in the world at the time. Kennedy also praised the foresight and ingenuity of Fulbright. At the end of World War II, you saw both the need and the opportunity to establish a large-scale exchange program with other nations on the principle of a two-way street. Kennedy concluded his formal remarks by saying, thanks to your leadership in this field, Congress is presently considering new legislation which would consolidate and strengthen various existing legislation and thereby establish a firm basis for moving forward in the 60s. This new legislation Kennedy referenced was the Mutual Educational and Cultural Exchange Act of 1961, better known as the Fulbright-Hayes Act, which Kennedy signed into law on September 23, 1961, marking the beginning of a new chapter in the history of the Fulbright program. It provided the foundations for the future growth and expansion of the Fulbright program and still serves as the statutory basis of the program today. Finally, Kennedy praised the Fulbright program with a reference to the Old Testament. Of all the examples in recent history of beating swords into plowshares, of having some benefit come to humanity out of the destruction of war, I think that this program and its results will be among the most preeminent.